Hello, everyone, and welcome in to a special edition of the RTI Recruiting Podcast with Vol Recruiting Reports. Welcome you in. I'm Nathaniel Rutherford, Managing Editor at RockyTopInsider.com, joined again by Brandon Martin and Matt Ray of Vol Recruiting Reports. If you missed the last podcast, Rocky Top Insider and Vol Recruiting Reports are teaming up for the foreseeable future to give you even more recruiting coverage on both sites, uh, just combining forces here to kind of give you the best of both worlds with RTI and VR2. But guys, it's a special edition because, you know, we are normally we just kind of have a, a recruiting podcast where we talk about some big topics in, in Tennessee recruiting, uh, talk about you know, maybe upcoming announcements to kind of watch for. This one is a special edition. It won't be as, as long as the other ones, but this one is special because Tennessee picked up not just a run-of-the-mill kind of average, you know, commitment on Friday afternoon. Tennessee got one of their, their top guys on their board, uh, not just at his position, but kind of overall. Uh, he, is, he was very, very high on Tennessee's recruiting board. Four-star outside linebacker slash weak side defensive end B.J. Ojolari from Marietta, Georgia. Pulled the trigger on Friday, announced his commitment to Tennessee, picking them over the perceived kind of three finalists of LSU, Auburn, and, and Tennessee. He also uh, had Georgia, Alabama, and Florida as his other finalists that he announced uh, about a week or so ago when he said he was going to make his announcement on Friday. Guys, we talked about it in the last podcast when we were kind of previewing uh, three or four names of guys who are set to announce you know, their commitments and everything soon and what Tennessee's chances were. Eric Shaw went ahead and announced his commitment. He chose South Carolina. That, that wasn't a big surprise. That's kind of what we all expected. BJ Ojolari, though, that one kind of – this whole past week has been a kind of a roller coaster. It looked like it was going to be LSU. Matt, you had a lot of information that you shared with us in the last podcast. Now he committed to Tennessee. And, guys, I know we both we, – we have the impact report on RockyTopInsider.com. I know you guys are going to have plenty of analysis and stuff uh, on BJ – on VolRecruitingReports.org. You have the commitment piece up there where you interviewed BJ and got his thoughts, and he mentioned, you know, Brian Niedermeyer playing a big role, the fact that Tennessee has Harrison Bailey committed and Ramel Keaton on the team played a big role for him. But, Matt, I, I want to get your, your analysis on this. How big of a get is BJ Ojolari? Because I know what I know what the rankings say. They, they say he's obviously kind of a, a high four-star, number 157 overall player on the 247 Sports Composite rankings, but... I know from conversations you and I have had before off, you know, off the record, this, this staff is much as highly rated as he is. This staff is even higher on him than what his ratings would, would even suggest. Uh, yeah, this, this is a massive get at this point for this class heading into September when guys start focusing, focusing on their season more than they do recruiting. Um, th this is huge. T BJ Ojolari, was at the top of the board for Tennessee, has been since Jeremy Pruitt got there. Um, the staff is very fired up about it. They're, they're getting their blue chip pass rusher. They're getting the guy that can come in and replace Darrell Taylor um, immediately, you know, if one of these um, – one of the guys on campus isn't ready to. Um, the competition for that position just got a lot stiffer. Um but you saw the coaches kind of take to Twitter after the announcement, and mm -hmm. everybody is – everybody's very fired up. But outside of just getting this blue-chip prospect, this is big on the recruiting trail for Tennessee. They truly beat Auburn. They truly beat LSU. And they truly beat a late push for um, – from Georgia. Georgia had, had stayed in contact this week. And with, with the uh, departure of Brenton Cox, they would – have liked to have kept BJ if they could have. I think at the end of the day, multiple guys I talked to, um, including a Georgia insider, said that his heart's at Tennessee, the connections are there at Tennessee, despite his brother being at Georgia, the connections are at Tennessee, and that's where he sees himself fitting in at now. Um, LSU was really selling the Arden Key role, and mm -hmm. Late July, first of August, it, it did kind of get rough. Tennessee was the leader in the clubhouse for a while, and that's where when LSU made that shakeup, it, it was LSU at one point. It really does appear that way, but that's where Brian Niedermeyer comes in, and that's where he shows his ability to close the deal once again. Niedermeyer, Niedermeyer was huge in this. Um, our One of our lead analysts, Dale Dowden, was – at Marietta today, talked in depth with BJ again outside of what we had. And, and a lot of this came down to Niedermeyer. But don't write off Chris Rumpf here either. He, um, he, di he did a lot in this one as well. Um, saw him back in the spring. 
checking in on BJ at the spring game. So Tennessee, Tennessee has been in this one since day one for BJ, really, and, and it paid off today. So a lot of momentum in a lot of different ways, and one that we'll talk about in a minute is Eric Gilbert. Yeah, Brandon, I know you you are one of the guys responsible for um, doing a lot of kind of the analysis and, and kind of what the impact of these these recruits are going to have. I know the first podcast we did, you and I spoke about you know, what kind of impact Jalen Hyatt can have. I look at B.J. Ojolari and, well, first, I, I guess one of the questions I have for you is, you know, he's, he's listed at 6'3", 225. I saw a recent picture of him from one of Marietta's practices, and it looks like, you know, I still think he's a little undersized, but it looks like he's he's closer to that maybe 235-ish range now because he, he looks like he just kind of, you know, hit the weight room pretty hard this off season. So I, I'm curious on your thoughts on is he a guy who you expect to come in and and you know fill the role that what you know what Darrell Taylor has it be that be that guy off the edge um or, or is he a guy that maybe has a, as a ceiling of maybe looking at kind of what uh Kyle Phillips or what um Latrell Bumpus is for Tennessee this upcoming season of being that defensive end hand in the dirt because at Marietta he plays both standing up outside linebacker and with his hand in the dirt defensive end. So I, I, I lean more towards saying he's going to be more of the Darrell Taylor type, but I'm curious on your, your kind of analysis of him, what you expect more from him at, at Tennessee. I feel like he's tailor-made to be uh, that Darrell Taylor role. Mm. Uh, he, I'm with you. He looks bigger than, than his current weight rankings. I think he's probably in that 230, 235 range. And then when he gets on campus, that re- that's going to go up a little bit more. You're going to get Craig Fitzgerald with him. You're also going to build some functional strength. So it won't just be size. It's going to be good weight, good functional strength. Uh, and, again, he's he's 17 right now. As he gets older, he's going to get bigger. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and that will help. But he is a guy that when, when he gets on campus, he's going to be contending for playing time. He's going to be in a position to immediately start in that role. Uh Matter of fact, I would think he'll be one of the front runners for it. He is. Uh, everybody, you, you see him, and he's very athletically gifted. He's very fast. He has a fantastic first step. Uh, I don't know what his forty is. I would love to know what his forty is, uh, because he is. He's one of those guys on film that runs people down from behind, mm-hmm. uh, runs running backs down from behind on the opposite side don't, of the field. Don't want to interrupt you, Brandon, but. Don't hold me to this four point seven eight or four point seven. Yeah, I can't remember I, the one number. It's, it's it's in the four point seven range. I think in the Nike one of the regional camps, he ran about a four point seven six or so. And I think they mentioned about a four point eight at the actual Nike opening final. So somewhere around that four point seven, four point eight. And I know his his shuttle time was around a it was a it was a sub four four shuttle, which is that's, that's was, arguably yes. more important than than the forty time. Yeah, for yeah him, great, absolutely. Great, great, sm- great small area quickness. His first step off the ball is devastating. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing with BJ that sticks out to me on tape, and the more I watched, especially at the opening film they had of him, the more I was impressed. Uh, it's not just speed. It's not just strength for him. It's the way he uses his hands. He has a swim move that if he gets on your, if he gets on your outside arm, you have, to, you have to go back and watch it in slow motion to see how he actually works his hands to get that outside arm free and get his shoulder ducked and get his shoulder past you because it is just a split second. I mean, it's it's almost instantaneous. And with his kind of speed and size, if he is that quick and his technique is that good and that polished and he's that sudden because you can't you can't prepare for it. It's a, it's a really I love watching defensive linemen play and so it's it, it's a beautiful thing to me. It's a beautiful compact elegant move it saves a lot of uh movement it's not overly exaggerated it's very very quick and clean uh i'll be honest with you nathaniel my my background a lot of it is in the martial arts and when i started watching him i see a lot of that in it. it's it's almost that that simplicity of movement that conservation of movement that you would see in a martial arts technique And it's just one move in a flash, and he has his hand, he has your hand off of him as an offensive tackle. His his inside shoulder is under your outside arm, and he has turned the corner on you. And at that point, the only thing you can do is hold him. Hold him and hope you don't get called, because if you don't, he's going to kill your quarterback. I'm glad you said that, Brandon. Um, The impressive thing, and I talked about it in the commitment article, I've talked about it with several people. The impressive thing about B.J. is is you're looking at a kid that's 235 pounds that plays offensive tackle for Marietta, 
and turns around and plays defensive end, hand in the dirt, and then plays in space on passing downs. So you're talking about a kid last year that blocked Kevin Harris, Owen Papo, and, and True Thompson, all three division players. you got Thompson that went to Florida State. You've got Papo, who's at Auburn now, and Kevin Harris, who's at Alabama. Um, elite pass rushers. Then he turns around and goes to the other side of the ball and has to rush the passer against – Wanye Morris, who we all know, and then Trinte Jones, who is a, a Michigan enrollee. So it, he's doing all of this playing Iron Man football and playing special teams. When this kid gets to campus and he is solely able to focus on being an outside linebacker, he's going to kind of do like his brother did at Georgia, blow up. Um, it, he's He's got a chance to be really, really special, and – his rankings are not – his rankings are high, but they're not indicative of what he brings to the football field because he, he's done all this playing Ironman football. So, it, it, to me, it's very impressive. I think a guy with a real similar situation to that on Tennessee's team right now is Elijah Simmons. Uh, you know, we, we yeah. talked about him him last year playing – at 330 playing defensive tackle and offensive guard almost every snap at Pearl Cone uh, – playing the whole game both ways and still making plays on both sides of the ball at the end of the game. And some people have been shocked by how he has blown up since he's got to UT. And I was never really surprised. I was a big fan of him from the first time I saw him. And it's, it was one of the things I talked about in the initial breakdown of him is when he gets to school and he only has to focus on being on one side of the ball – that's going to be a huge difference. And it's the same thing for BJ. When he gets there and he only has to focus on being an outside linebacker, how, how much better is his technique going to get? Because as a, as a guy who appreciates defensive linemen, he's a technician. Now, yeah. he, has all the, he has all the raw physical talent, but he's a technician. His hands are excellent. They're, they're as good as there are in this class. He has inside moves. He has outside moves. He knows how to set you up. He's also a very intelligent player. Uh, we don't need to get that lost uh, in this as well. Very workmanlike attitude, uh, doesn't bust a lot of coverages, doesn't make a lot of mistakes. But from that pass rusher point of view, he's smart enough to know how to set you up. He's going to feed you something early in a game that he can go back to on a third down when they really need a sack or really need to get a quarterback to get rid of the ball. He can feed you a similar look and do something different off of it. And that intelligence is going to play – a big part in this. It's one of the reasons I think Pruitt and his staff are so high on him is he's not just a good athlete. He's not just a good pass rusher. He's a very intelligent player. They believe he can pick up the scheme and, and do so quickly and be an immediate impact for them. And that's, uh, that's important. That's a, that's a big boon and a big bonus that they have in him right now. Uh, I think BJ is going to push to start right away. We, you know, we know Pruitt is not afraid to start freshmen. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to see that even more this year. But BJ is as, as good in this position as there, as maybe as there is in the country. I mean, I'll go that far. I think he's ideal for what Pruitt wants in this defense. And the the time playing offensive tackle is going to benefit him as well. You know, you have had to block these elite pass rushers like Matt's talked about, which means you have the mindset of, I know what it is to be an offensive tackle. I know what an offensive tackle is going to do to try to close out a great pass rusher. And it gives you that other level, and with his intelligence, that gives you another level of what can I do to throw them off? What can I do to beat this? You know, understanding your opponent. Uh, I'm. This was a huge, huge, huge get for Tennessee, and I am. I'm. If there were no other implications, and there are a lot, but if there were no other implications, Tennessee got a guy in B.J. Ojolari who can not just start as a freshman; he can make a huge impact as a freshman. Yeah, I I, I agree, and you were talking about kind of his football intelligence and everything. That that was one thing, aside from just the pure athleticism, as you said, the his first step is, is deadly. But uh, one of the other things that stood out to me watching his film, and this is even just from his junior year, and I, I went back and watched some more film of his stuff, some highlights from what he did at the opening, but just from his junior film highlights from the, on the actual football field, it, it just seems like, to me, Ojolari just was always there to make a play, even if it was, you know, a guy... Yep. It doesn't always have to be a tackle for a loss or a sack. There was a pass play where it didn't look like Ojolari should have been able to get to the guy where he was in the flat. I mean, the guy was already, you know, five or six yards down the field when he caught the ball. But Ojolari got there 
and it was in position to make the tackle before he gained anything else. It, there, there was no yards after catching that play. It looked like there should have been yards after catching that play, and Ojulari was there because of his, his instincts, his speed, and he, had, he has really long arms too. It, he just has, to me, he has the full package, and he's a guy that he's bigger than what Darrell Taylor was coming out of high school. Uh, Darrell Taylor looked like a wide receiver when he came out of high school. Ojulari looks like... I guess maybe to a, a slimmer tight end, I guess is maybe how you could describe him. He doesn't have to put on as much weight as Darrell Taylor uh, had to put on. And, and, you know, his, his whole career at Tennessee, it, it, it's a year behind where I think it should have been for him. But that's that's more on uh, this, the, you know, the previous coaching staff than anything, I think, for Darrell Taylor. So, again, a little bit on Taylor, but it, it's more on the previous coaching staff to me. Ojalar is a guy who, with this coaching staff and with the, the pedigree they've had of, you know, being able to develop players and with Craig Fitzgerald and the strength conditioning program, um, I, I fully expect, as you said, uh, Brandon, if nothing else, he will be a, a sub package nightmare where a guy on obvious passing downs is coming in and is going to rush the passer. But I, I fully, I, it would not shock me at all if he is vying for some sort of starting role on Tennessee's defense as a true freshman. But I think from the analysis standpoint, I think we, we've, pretty well cover the bases there with BJ. And I also think, like we've mentioned, he's not just a pass rushing guy. He, he can move very well sideline to sideline, has very good lateral movement. Um, he's just a, a very well-rounded overall player. But from, you mentioned Brandon and, and Matt, I think you may have mentioned it a little bit too. There are more implications here than just Tennessee getting a, a really good prospect in BJ Ojolari. Obviously, he's already got his teammate and quarterback Harrison Bailey committed to Tennessee. But we've kind of teased that a little bit already here. Eric Gilbert, the five-star tight end, is also committed to Tennessee. Um, Matt, I know you all had some stuff, and I'll, I'll let you tease that here in a second too. I know you had some stuff um, behind the, in the premium stuff you all been doing now on Patreon for all recruiting reports on Eric Gilbert. But I'm curious, does in your mind, does BJ Ojolari's commitment to Tennessee does that give Tennessee another edge? Because, you know, Mariota's going to have a lot of guys in this, this 2020 class go to different schools. We, we've already seen, you know, before even Ojolari committed, they had uh, Harris Bailey committed to Tennessee. They had the defensive back Torrance committed to Florida. They have other guys, you know, looking at other schools, other big-time uh, schools. They have a running back. They have a, a receiver who's getting attention, Kobe Stewart. And then uh, Videl, I think, is the other guy's uh, name, is the running back. They, they have a lot of guys getting attention. But now he's got two guys who are committed to the same team. Does BJ Ojolari's, yeah, yeah, and Royal Keaton too, who's on Tennessee's roster this year, does Ojolari's commitment does it change anything with Gilbert? And and what are what are some of the stuff you want to share um, about Gilbert that you have, you know, and in, in, in the premium paywall right now too? This one moves the needle. This one moves the moves the needle for Tennessee. Bailey being there is huge. Yeah, it's the guy that throws you the football every Friday night and has for three years. It's the guy that you may set state records with they're close bj and eric are even closer um the these are two guys may i i mean i can't speak to the relationship but these are two guys when they're around each other they're laughing they're having a good time they genuinely care for each other um you can tell they're really close not to say that it's not the same way with with Eric and Harrison, but you get a different feel when you're around them. Um, so Dale was down there today, and I'll leave you with this quote from the premium content that we have on Ojolari and Gilbert. And again, if you if you haven't subscribed yet, it's two dollars a month. You get article access, uh, premium weekly notebooks when we start covering games, and then in events like this, premium content from that. Um, this was probably my favorite uh, quote from Ojolari. Um, I think the chances are pretty high right now since he has seen me, Harrison, and Ramel choose Tennessee. But th this is the kicker for me, and I think it's one that could kind of change the game for Tennessee. I am going to do everything in my power to get him here. Um, mm -hmm. Since last November, since, since November, when Harrison Bailey committed, I was sitting there in the Marietta Performing Arts Center. I asked, because he was the guy that was going to be the cornerstone of the class. I asked, where does it start for you? And his answer was simple. Right here at Marietta High School with Eric Gilbert. Well, it stayed that way, and it's been, it's been Gilbert and Bailey, Gilbert and Bailey, Gilbert and Bailey. But 
Tennessee has worked hard with Ojolari in this recruitment while prioritizing these other two guys. And I think it I think it's really gonna stand out. So Dale was able to catch up with Gilbert and, and he admitted it, it really helps Tennessee with BJ committing there, uh, on top of what they already have. I think this one moves the needle a little bit more for Tennessee and I think I think it does give them more of an upper hand on top of the fact that they're the only school recruiting him as a wide receiver right now, which he has admitted appeals to him a tremendous amount. Well, and if, if Gilbert wasn't enough, and he certainly is, you talk about one of the elite athletes in the nation in this class, I still feel like Rashad Torrance is a guy who could potentially flip. And if you, if you have Gilbert saying this helps Tennessee's cause, this helps their chances, and we felt like they were in a good place to begin with, you may potentially even be able to, you know, if you can land Gilbert, maybe you bring uh, bring Torrance as well. Mm-hmm. I, I I would be very intrigued to see what happens with Torrance. And obviously, the the main attention is going to be placed on, uh, on on Gilbert because he's a five star and he's a he's a guy that should be able to come in and make just. I mean, talk about an immediate impact. I mean, Gilbert will be <laughs> with Dominic Wood Anderson gone. Gilbert or Darnell Washington, whichever of those two tight ends, if Tennessee is able to get either one of them, those guys are going to be able to come in and, and have an it just an immediate, instant, huge. I mean, I don't think it can be understated how big of an impact those guys would be able to have on on Tennessee's offense. But you mentioned it there, maybe both of you, uh, Brandon and Matt. I mean, Torrance is a guy that I still. I I, th- I I if I had to choose right now, I mean, this is still what August sixteenth, and we're recording this. If I had to choose right now, I, I think he's going to stick with his Florida commitment, but Tennessee is not letting up there at all. We, we've seen Tennessee, they, they seem like they are very much wanting to take as many defensive backs in this class as they can. I mean, they, they lost a commitment from Antonio Johnson, but they're not, by no means out of it. We sort of mentioned, we mentioned a little bit more comic Daniel, and then, funny enough, Matt and I were texting after the podcast came out. Um, the recruiting podcast came out, I think it was uh, Wednesday when it came out, and it was I think the very next day or very next morning, or very, maybe even that night after we already recorded it, uh, Mordecai McDaniel came out and said that he's going to go ahead and make his his announcement next week, but we, we, we touched on you know, Tennessee, we relaxed him, he relaxed Tennessee, and there's a lot of momentum there. I mean, Tennessee already has Keyshawn Lawrence, they have Lovey Jenkins, they have Art Green, uh, I, I think Callaway or Darian Williamson, the, the two guys who are committed to Tennessee as athletes, one of those guys, if not both of them, could have you know futures in the secondary. Tennessee is still pursuing a, a couple other secondary targets in this in this 2020 class, so I, I I would be a little more hesitant on him, but I really do think this does, as you mentioned, Matt. I mean, I think this one's a little bit more of a difference maker for Gilbert. I I am curious. This is kind of getting off topic just a little bit, but it's a question I want to ask you, Matt, and then we can go um, to talk about something else, Brandon, that you want to mention here um, about you know kind of guys Tennessee can maybe pair with B.J. Ojolari, but Matt. A question I have for you when it comes to Tennessee's tight end recruitment right now, obviously the two names that everyone's talking about and, and the two names that I think that are, are the one number one, number two are kind of 1A, 1B on Tennessee's board are Gilbert and Darnell Washington, both five-star guys. What is your, your gut feeling of both of them? Obviously, you, you kind of gave your, your feeling on Gilbert right now, so I, I guess more or less the question is what is your feeling on Washington? And, and do you think Tennessee has a, a better chance at one or the other right now? And just kind of what's your feeling overall on both those five-stars right now? I said uh, in the premium content about uh, at the first of the week that I felt confident in saying that Tennessee is one, either one or two, depending on what day it is, with Alabama. I think Georgia is playing third right now. Um, obviously, that can change. Um, with BJ in the fold, I think I, I like Tennessee's chances even more. I I would probably put it 51-49 Tennessee over who is in that second spot. I think it's probably Alabama. Um, I, I like Tennessee's chances more with with Gilbert at the end of the day. Do you sell? You, you've sold Gilbert on being a wide receiver if you get him to commit. Hmm. I think Tennessee's going to give him that chance to play wide receiver. I don't think – Jeremy Pruitt is a straight shooter, and I don't think that's just a recruiting pitch to Eric Gilbert to get him there – and let him play tight end. They already have a good tight end there in Jackson Lowe. So if you move him out next year to wide receiver, I think Gilbert can impact the game. He does it against some of the best competition in the country on Friday nights already. I think he can have that same impact on Saturdays. 
Um, are you able to sell Darnell Washington on coming in and being that guy with Gilbert? You know, we're, can you tell him that we're going to put Gilbert at wide receiver? We're going to put you at tight end. Who is going to cover you in the red zone? I think that if Tennessee can get Gilbert, Washington's not going to decide up until closer to signing day. I think that's where you see Tennessee have their best chance with Washington. Right now, I think I think Tennessee is is probably second or third for Washington. And Brian Niedermeyer again is the guy here, so don't discount Tennessee, but I think they have I think they have a lot I have a lot of work to do to get Washington and I think Gil, uh, Georgia is probably number one there. It would be interesting to see what they're able to do with Washington. Uh, I think because they are they are going to give Gilbert that chance to be a wide receiver if he comes to Tennessee. That that's the plan. You you can do exactly what you said. You can tell tell Washington, hey, we're going to let you play tight end. We're going to let Gilbert play a wide receiver. You know that, and we have a quarterback in Harrison Bailey. We have uh, Ramel Keaton here. That's got to be appealing to a guy like Washington to realize I have an opportunity to come in and be a part of a special class. Yeah, I with with Gilbert being pitched as a receiver, that 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 does kind of throw an interesting wrinkle in uh, for Washington. And, and you all, I think to your to your credit, I think you all were the the first I saw that mentioned uh, the fact that Tennessee was recruiting. Gilbert as a receiver, just from you know, from y'all talking to him, from the interview y'all, y'all had with him, that y'all the first one I recall seeing it. So, so kudos to you guys for you know getting that information and having that kind of first. But I think that does kind of throw an interesting wrinkle into the whole thing with Gilbert and Washington, and it, it also kind of throws back to if those two want to play on the same team together. I mean, there, there's those two, those guys are competitive. I don't think they're you know, I, I think the competition, I don't think they mind it, but it just you also at the same time got to get to realize, hey Tennessee, if they if they get one of those guys, they also have the possibility of getting Rakeem Jarrett in this class. They have Jalen Hyatt in this class. They're going to have, you know, they, they should have plenty of targets or plenty of opportunity for targets to go around next year. But there's also Eric Gray coming out of the backfield. If Ty Chandler doesn't go pro, he's coming out of the backfield too. I mean, there, there's only so many targets you can have going around um, over the next couple of years. So I, I think that'll be very intriguing to see if one of those guys does commit to Tennessee, how that affects the other one. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Alabama – I would be stunned if Alabama doesn't get one of them. Uh, Georgia already has the Theo kid committed to them, I, I, if I remember correctly. Or Alabama, what, which one has the, the Theo uh, Johnson kid committed to him? Is it Alabama or Georgia? I'm suddenly forgetting. Um, I'm not, I, I, think, mean, I, I think he's a Georgia lean. I'm not sure that he's committed okay, yet. He's not committed I may be wrong. Maybe. I may be wrong. Let me check. Hold no, on. you're right. I, I just looked about Theo Johnson. He's not yeah, committed. I, that for, I, I was, I I was so heavily thinking he was – yeah, he's so heavily a Georgia lean, I think, that I assumed he was committed to, to, to the Bulldogs already. He, he's not committed to the Bulldogs. The one he, thing – As you said, he's thing, a heavy lean. The one thing that interests me about that with Washington is if you don't want to play with Gilbert, George, and Georgia is the leader like everybody assumes – you are going to probably have to play with another elite tight end at Georgia. Yep. Can Tennessee crack the door and say, hey, we're we're moving this guy to, to wide receiver. You're going to have to go to here and compete automatically at that position. You can come here and be the guy. Be the guy. I, I, his recruitment is going to be very interesting. And that's why I, I've told a lot of people, don't count Alabama out. If, mm -hmm. if Tennessee gets... Eric Gilbert, do not count Alabama out for Darnell Washington because I think he wants to be the guy, and rightfully so. Um, at Georgia, there's there's going to they were recruiting at very high level at tight end. I mean, I think four of the top five tight ends of the country have them in their final list of schools, so no surprise there. But he's probably going to have to play with some premier talent when he gets there, so that's something to keep an eye on too. Well, schematically, it's going to be interesting. Nathaniel, you mentioned there's only so many footballs to go around, but let's look at let's take a quick look at who Tennessee's got calling the plays now because mm -hmm. it it's not like Jim Chaney has a history of having multiple wide receivers, tight ends, and running backs catching a lot of passes with quarterbacks that spread the ball around when he's got a big arm quarterback and a pretty good offensive line. Oh wait, that's what he's done most of his career. Uh, that's what he's done in his last stand at Tennessee. And you're talking about being able to potentially come in with a guy like Harrison Bailey. Uh, if we're wish listing here, maybe Arik Gilbert. You know, Jalen Hyatt's already on, is already committed. 
Ramel Keaton's already on the roster. You've got a few of the guys. Uh, Cedric Tillman's still going to be there. Palmer's still going to be there. You've got Gray and Chandler coming out of the backfield that are good receivers. All those guys you you mentioned, but you look at Darnell and go, you know, if we put Arik at wide receiver, we can rotate you and Jackson Lowe at tight end. We can run any – you have at that point have the personnel to run any offensive formation you want with a quarterback that – is outstanding at reading defenses, getting the ball to his playmakers, playing for an offensive coordinator who has a way of getting his playmakers the ball and has been good throughout his career at spreading the ball around, keeping everybody happy and making everybody productive. I think that's an area you may see Tennessee pitch as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Uh, Brandon, to, to kind of stick with you here and to kind of close out the podcast uh, as the, the last topic here, you, you kind of mentioned it. I can't remember if you mentioned it on – the recording yet or not but I know you mentioned it before we hit record here of you know what kind of what kind of guys can Tennessee pair with OJLR because we we, you know one of the biggest misses I guess guess one of the big gripes you could have about Tennessee's there wasn't very many because Tennessee I think closed very strong in the 2019 class but the the one thing you could circle uh, that I you know the staff I think themselves would also say that they're disappointed in was they they didn't get a a premier edge rusher. You know, they 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 missed out on the Justin Boyd Bees. They they got it. You know, some good pass rushers, in my opinion, in Roman Harrison and I think Quaveris Crouch. It's interesting. He's been practicing so much at outside linebacker in the fall that, you know, I, I wonder what kind of role he's going to play there as well. But to me, B.J. Ojolari gives them a very a, a, you know a very good pass rusher that like you, we both mentioned here that or all three of us mentioned that you know fits that Darrell Taylor mold. Brandon, what else in your opinion? Who else could Tennessee you know, potentially lend in this class to, to kind of pair with B.J. Ojolari as, as, you know, more pass rushers or, or kind of defensive end type prospects in this 2020 class? A couple of guys that you're going to hear talked about a lot are, are, are two Tennessee guys. I mean, really, they don't have to leave the state for any of these guys. Uh, Tyler Barron is definitely going to be a guy that gets mentioned. Jay Hardy is going to be a guy that gets mentioned. But both of those guys are more of a 3-4 defensive end. And, and Tennessee feels like in that last class they missed on the 3-4 end and they missed on the – on the 3-4 outside linebacker, edge rusher. But they can stay in state for that, too. Uh, Right now, the number one player in the state of Tennessee is Reggie Grimes out at Ravenwood. And Grimes is a little bit of a do-everything football player on both sides of the ball, but he is going to make his money at the next level or make his money in uh, going forward as as an outside linebacker defensive end. Uh, I'm actually on my way uh, when we – when we uh, finish our podcast recording, I'm going to be on my way uh, to watch their scrimmage tonight to get a look at him and get an interview with him, talk with him some, and maybe see a little bit more about where his recruiting stands. Because right now it's pretty wide open, and Grimes is a fantastic athlete. Uh, he is he is an eye-popping athlete, and the fact that you could come in and maybe – and for Tennessee, this is this is pretty realistic. You don't have to squint really hard to see this. But your your two deep for your two outside linebacker slots next year could be Roman Harrison, Quaveras Crouch, Reggie Grimes, and B.J. Ojolari in some combination. Phew. Holy cow! Now that is that is some firepower. And of course, two of those guys are already on campus. B.J. committed today, and Tennessee has been strong with Reggie the whole time. They've stayed on him. He's the number one player in the state. You know they'd like to keep him home. And Reggie's recruitment's been strange at this point, but he is a big, strong, physical athlete. Uh, he's bigger than BJ. Uh, he's bigger than BJ. He, I think he, I think he would probably. I think when he hits the weight room, he's actually probably going to beef up a little more. But good speed, good strength, good, good at everything. There's not a whole lot of holes in his game. Uh, he's a good enough athlete. I feel they could put him in space. But you talk about being able to put him opposite BJ. That is, that is a pair of devastating pass rushers. Especially if you've got Jay Hardy and Tyler Barron as your as your three four ends, and these are all guys Tennessee is really in great shape with. They're really in in a good a good spot with right now. And could realistically land. Uh, I, I'll I'll be interested to see how BJ's commitment affects Trayvon Ripka hmm. next week. Yeah, that, that's one we talked about in the previous podcast, too, of, of you know, guys who are committing, committing soon and what Tennessee's chances are. We, we, we all mentioned we think it'll be Kentucky, but I don't think anyone really has a, a good idea. I think both schools, 
uh, from what we've talked about, from what you guys told me too, I think both schools feel like they're in a good spot with him, but I don't think he's told either school of, of Tennessee or Kentucky where he's going to go. So that that's going to be one to mention. If, if he commits to Tennessee, we may end up doing kind of a, a similar deal here. Um, but you also have two guys next week. We may wait until and see kind of what happens with, with both Mordecai McDaniel and Trevon Ribka because both those guys are committing in back-to-back days next week. So I, I, I feel comfortable in saying that I think Tennessee gets at least one of those guys. I don't know that they'll get both, but I think they'll get at least one. But I think that'll be where we end this podcast. Like I said, I wanted to be a little bit shorter than the other ones. It's still going to be you know, decently long, but hopefully we gave you all a bunch of good info. Go check out our impact report on RockyTopInsider.com of uh, what B.J. Ojalar brings to the table for Tennessee. We, we've mentioned most of that here, but if you want to read some stuff uh, and, and not just listen to the podcast, then you're welcome to do that there. Also visit VolRecruitingReports.org. They have all kinds of great content there. Um, you also, y'all also have noticed had a, an interview with Adonai Mitchell, who is a Tennessee receiver target as well. So I'll let you all um, plug your stuff here in just a second. If you want to go follow Rocky Top Insider stuff, we're at Rocky Top Insider on Twitter. We have Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, which is another way you can you know interact with the podcast as well. We'll have a, a link to or have a, a YouTube video of the podcast up here shortly as well. Visit all this stuff on there. Like I said, RockyTopInsider.com is the website. But guys, go ahead and let everybody know where they can access all of the Ball Recruiting Report stuff as well. All right. As Brandon just mentioned, um, he is fixing to head to see Reggie Grimes. Uh, Dale was at Marietta today for BJ's announcement. I am still in South Dakota on vacation, but we are not done for the day. Dale is on his way back to Chattanooga. He will be at Finley Stadium tonight at 8 to see 8 Eastern to see Jay Hardy. And then again at 9 for their second scrimmage of the evening. Um, so be sure to get over to Vol Recruiting Reports Twitter at underscore VR2 underscore. Um, check us out on Instagram at Vol Recruiting Reports and Facebook at Vol Recruiting Reports. We'll post different stuff on different social media platforms. Um, and then be sure to get over to the website where the commitment article is with B.J. Jalari. We went pretty in-depth with him. Um, if you check out the premium content, you'll know that we did two commitment interviews with him, one on Tuesday, and then turned around and did one again this past Wednesday when it was Tennessee once again. So um, get over there and check all that stuff out. Again, that's volrecruitingreports.org. Uh, we appreciate all you guys. And, again, we thank Nathaniel for having us on. Find us at uh, VR2 on Facebook. Uh, we'll be posting some things up there as well. Give us a follow. Uh, if you want to follow any of us individually, Matt runs the, the VR2 account. I'm Brandon at VR2. Uh, Dale is Dale. Um, uh, Dale is Dale at VR2. Feel free to give us a uh, give us a follow as well. We try to put, put out as much good content as we can. And uh, sometimes we don't know where we're going until – Real short notice because we find out somebody's playing or somebody will have us or wants us to show up and we go. So there may not be a lot of announcements, but as long as you follow us, you may be able to to get the jump on some good content. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure you're following them. They're they're all great followers, not just for you know stuff like that, but just for everything else they do covering Tennessee recruiting. And we are happy to be partnered along with the guys. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Mr. Underscore Rutherford. But that'll do it for this special edition episode of the RTI Recruiting Podcast with Vol Recruiting Imports. We appreciate all of you tuning in and listening along. If you want to listen to the other RTI Recruiting uh, Podcast with VR2 and our regular RTI Podcast, you can subscribe to us um, on Apple Podcasts. You also, we're available on Android devices as well. RockyTopInsider.com. You can click on the podcast tab on our homepage there as well. And listen to it straight from that webpage or download it from there. And I mentioned earlier, we have YouTube for all that stuff as well. But until next time, this has been another episode of the RTI Recruiting Podcast with Evolve Recruiting Reports.